You can turn with me in your Bibles this morning over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. In a number of ways, I've been reminded recently of the, the superficiality, the emptiness, the weariness of heart and mind that characterizes man's religion. Thankfully, Christianity is characterized by relationship with the living and true God. And there's only one. It was uh, one day this past week that the, the people across the lane finished up their annual fast and the, the field was filled, and filled with cars and the lane was filled with cars and all these people coming to worship that which is no God. According to a system that is man-contrived, and the world is filled with such. I'm reading a, a book lately by Amy Carmichael from the previous century ministry, a missionary, spent 50 years without a furlough in India when the, the caste system of Hinduism was very entrenched. They've made some changes in modern times from what I understand, but the world is filled with empty religion, isn't it? Empty religion. If you're a born-again believer, if you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ, then you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And you know your maker personally. And you're getting to know him more and more. You're growing in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christianity is, of course, any religion has their form, and it's, it's some superficiality and empty ceremony and ritual that Jesus addresses at this portion of the Sermon on the Mount that we'll be looking at in a moment. And we want to talk about it. There's a lot of Christianity that is basic relationship, a trust and confidence in the living and true God. Amen? A humble submission to the direction of his Holy Spirit. Remembering always that God looks on the heart, doesn't he? He knows what's in our heart. We're not impressing him with form. You know, there are some uh, beautiful big churches. Again, I, <clears throat> in one of our uh, math books, there was a, a picture of <clears throat> the, the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral there in Paris. I don't know what's left of it. After the fire of a few years ago, I don't know what kind of progress is being made, but uh, a beautiful structure and edifice, isn't it? The, the, the complexity and the ornateness of the, of the carvings in stone and all the glass and wood and beautiful edifices that people have built for their religions. But for God, for God, the Bible tells us that the tabernacle of God is with men not in a building made by hands. Amen? He dwells in the hearts of his people. And he desires to come on in and do his good work of making us beautiful, a beautiful dwelling place. When we approach the relationship in humility, in sincerity, we're not interested in impressing people. We stand before God Almighty. Amen? And... We seek to genuinely honor him, love him with our all. Thankfully, he does his good work. He does his good work. We read from the first part of, of chapter 6, and he addresses empty and shallow and superficial and man-contrived. And then he talks about genuine as well and how we are to honor God with genuine and humble submission to the will and work of God. From verse 1, take heed that you do not your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets 
that they may have glory for men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. We're going to drop down to verse 16. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Well, we've entitled this Good Deeds, Prayer, and Fasting. And <clears throat> let's first consider that in each of these cases, charitable deeds, prayer, and fasting, the Lord in teaching us, his disciples, does not teach us that it's to be considered if you do charitable deeds, if you pray, if you fast. It's a given. These practices are just a normal part of normal Christianity. We often uh, do a little chuckling at the uh, need to use the qualifiers with regard to what kind of Christianity we're talking about. Normal Christianity. Amen? It's characterized by, accompanied by, these are the practices that are found in normal Christianity. They're Christians, they engage in charitable deeds, they pray, and they fast. Now, <clears throat> Don't get any too nervous. I'm not sure how much time we'll have to devote to fasting before the end of this morning anyways. <laughs> and that can be an uncomfortable one. The subject, the very thought of, makes folks nervous. But, <clears throat> but it's, not an, it's not an if, it's a when, isn't it? The... <clears throat> the Scripture says, just up a few verses <clears throat> of Matthew 5, 1, seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. And who's he teaching? The multitudes, the disciples, all those that came to him. This is not just the 12. This is... A lot of disciples, a lot of people that have been following him. Don't, uh, we don't think that, uh, <clears throat> well, everybody would recognize that um, prayers for all Christians, well, charitable deeds, I guess we should be involved in, in those. <clears throat> uh, fasting, those, that's for the particularly serious. Well, there we go again with the uh, qualifiers for Christianity, right? Uh, Christians are to be serious. They are to be zealous, aren't they? They're to be stirred up and fired up about more of Jesus. How often we are challenged by God from the scripture, and, and I'm confident in personal relationship, to take stock, to do some self-examination. How serious are we? How committed are we? 
And don't we want to be ever more so? We live in the midst of a wicked world, a wicked and perverse generation. We're to be shining forth as lights. Jesus is coming back soon. How are we living? What kind of an impact are we making on our generation? Are we having the kind of influence in the lives of our brothers and sisters? Are we ourselves ready for Jesus to come back at any moment? These are the kinds of things that the Holy Spirit's ever <clears throat> prodding us with, ever encouraging us with. Amen? And these are, words of, these are words of encouragement from the Master. He's just sorting it on out so that if you got it wrong, if you're doing what you're doing religiously for the wrong reasons, get it straightened out. He says, don't be like the hypocrites, the play actors, the pretenders. Don't pretend. You know, we place the emphasis on, on, on gathering and the importance of reading our Bibles. And, and we, you know, we, we assign uh, memory verses every week. And, and some would refrain from learning the memory verses. I'm not going to stick my hand and just show off those people just showing off. And I'm not, not only am I not going to put my hand up, I'm not even going to learn the verses. We're not doing what we're doing to be seen of men. But you know, the Bible says, <clears throat> in, a, in, a, in close context, uh, let your light so shine before men. Amen? That they see your good works and glorify your Father. And that's the kind of stuff that Jesus is addressing here, isn't it? Not glory for you, but glory for your Father. But the light should be shining brightly. And when you're involved in, in a charitable Righteous acts and deeds, good deeds. And you're praying and you're fasting. It does show up. And uh, good Christian people. So, well, you know, some might, might be impressed with you. But some will think, man, that's a good work. That's a good work of God. And they'll want to emulate it. They'll think, man, the, the life that I see, the fruit that's being born in that life. That's because they're serious about Jesus. Serious about seeking God. They're, they're not just pretending. They're not hypocrites. They're not pretenders or play actors. They're serious. And God's serious. And he challenges us all and encourages us all and he reproves and rebukes us at times when we need it, doesn't he? To get ever more serious. But these are just a normal part of healthy Christianity. These practices are for all. And I, I, I mean that with regard to fasting, We'll, we'll enjoy a little chuckle at that because it's probably the least practiced of these three. But Jesus puts it right in there with them, doesn't he? The way he communicates it here, it, it almost comes across as though it's just a given. It's understood that people practicing religion, good godly religion, are praying and fasting and involved in charitable acts, charitable deeds, good deeds. Prayer, fasting, you know, we would say we, uh, we pray when things, things got so bad, you know, we, we had to pray. There are times, and sure, uh, we would redouble our efforts in prayer and under pressure. But pray, we would be, be people who pray without ceasing, amen? Praying always. Not just when, when things are tough, extra tough. Or we might say that we need to change our perspective and consider that things are always tough. I got a sin problem that I got to contend with. Do those kinds of motives drive us to more fervent prayer? A loss of uh, self or an abandonment of self-interest that I might serve the needy around me? Am I willing to fast and pray to seek the Lord, to know his power in victory over sin. You know, when we're serious about living more holy lives, we seek God. We communicate to him that we're more serious, don't we? Not just, uh, you know, the desperate measures for desperate times. Or we might say, from the Christian perspective, times are always desperate. The lives of, of men, souls all around us, are hell-bound. How serious do we take it? In one place, 
instructing the disciples to pray just a few chapters forward. He tells the people to pray the Lord of the harvest that he sent forth laborers into the harvest because the harvest is, is great and the, the laborers are few. Jesus looking on the masses as sheep scattered, faint, having no shepherd, taken captive by the devil, most of them going to hell. And he says, pray, doesn't he? And when a Christian, a sincere Christian, a humble Christian, a righteous Christian, a committed Christian, a Christian Christian, these words like that, what do they do? They take it to heart, don't they? They pray and they fast and then they put their hand to the good work. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Talk about uh, good deeds. We're created for this stuff. Made for this stuff. From time to time we talk about using things according to their proper use. Right? Their proper use. And you don't take a, a tool. Well, you know what? There's, there's one that I've, I've got to confess to. You know, I, um, uh, we've got these lawnmowers around here. And they're intended for cutting grass. But if, I, I, there's, there are all these sticks in this yard that I mow up close to the house. And um, so if I can drive over it with a lawnmower, I'm driving over it. It's not only a grass cutter, but it's also a chipper. <laughs> is what I'm saying. <laughs> there are intended uses for tools. Lots of different things, aren't there? Yeah, lots of different things. God says that you were made for good works. You're in, the intended purpose that God has for you, among other things, is that you would carry out his work on this planet, his representative, that you would engage in charitable acts, seeking his face to know him more, that you'd be busy about his business. That's what you're made for. And we sometimes think we're bringing God along for the, uh, for the blessing on the ride that we have chosen. And we know better. You don't read your Bible very long at all. You sure don't come to services like this too many times. And we're reminded of those things, aren't we? Created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Hebrews 13, 16. Just a few passages that, <clears throat> that speak of what God's intention is for us. He says in verse 16, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. For, which, for with such sacrifices, God's well pleased. Your father who sees in secret, he'll reward you, won't he? Yeah. These are things that are pleasing to God for us to live our lives in, in commitment to him and consecration to him. With regard to prayer, sure, it says pray without ceasing. You know that passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, don't you? Prayer. How often, how much praying should we be doing? How uh, much attention should we be given to uh, uh, charitable acts, kind acts? Giving of ourselves, our substance, our all. Fasting. How much attention should it get? And these are, again, these are not just practices for the spiritual giants, the, superior, the, the spiritually superior. These are practices for all Christians. Love the way it's put there in the Sermon on the Mount. This is just... When you pray, when you, when, you, when you do charitable deeds, when you pray, when you fast. It's like a given, isn't it? Yep, yeah, it's just understood. That's going to be a part of your walk with the Lord. You're going to be involved in charitable acts, good deeds. You're going to be praying. You're going to be fasting. Not just for some special kinds of Christians. No, all Christians. <clears throat> there are those that say, well, I pray. And I engage in charitable acts sometimes, too. Don't stop now. And we sometimes let ourselves off the hook that way, don't we? We think of what we are doing. 
And sometimes people, sure, they, maybe they fast and pray. But they don't engage in charitable acts. And we should not be too selective just because, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll pray extra today so that I don't have to fast. It's sort of the way people think, right? I mean, that's practically speaking. Because they don't want to fast, I'll pray extra so that I don't have to go without food. And um, let's get more accustomed to thinking in terms of good deeds and praying and fasting and fasting. And understandably, yeah, we'll probably take a little extra time on fasting because we haven't talked about as much, um, as much about fasting. And, and, and yet the Bible says plenty about it. And it should be part of our practice, part of our normal practice. Cultivate the disciplines, you know, Okay, let's see. We got Moses, 40 days, 40 nights. Jesus, 40 days and nights. I want to be like Jesus, 40 days and 40 nights without eating. Now, how about start skipping breakfast? Okay. Or maybe start skipping the jelly on your toast at breakfast. <laughs> I mean, come on, where do we need to start, right? <clears throat> There's nobody here that wouldn't survive a day without eating. You had to go there, didn't you, Pastor? A whole day, a whole day. There's nobody here that wouldn't uh, that would that would die. Fasting, good practice, good practice. <clears throat> Cultivate the disciplines. <clears throat> Look at me over to Luke chapter five. Luke chapter five. I just count that as somebody saying amen. <laughs> mm. Keep talking. Keep talking, Grandpa. <laughs> like the sound of your voice. Mm -mm. From verse 33. And they said unto him, why, the, why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. Well, there you go. Yeah, I just let you off the hook, right? You're a disciple of Jesus and you're off the hook. You're not following John, and you're sure not following the Pharisees. And the disciples of Jesus, what do they do? Eat and drink. Yeah. I want to just make sure that we see how this was, this was commonplace, wasn't it? The disciples of the Pharisees, what? They're fasting and praying, aren't they? And the followers of John, John's the prophet. He is the man. He is the man on the scene, isn't he? Yep, he sure is. And his followers are doing what? Fasting and praying, aren't they? This is just the way. When people are serious about following the Lord, yep, they're fasting and praying. We'll talk about the, the benefits and the purposes of, of fasting as we go on, Lord willing. But notice that the way it's put to them. And he said unto them, can, can, the, can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come up. Well, if I let you off the hook in verse 33, then you're back on the hook in verse 35. Right? The days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. And that's where we are right now. Now we're, we're fasting because Jesus, the bridegroom, has been taken away. Amen? And now we're fasting and praying and, and engaged in, in the charitable deeds that we've been commanded to engage in. Look at me over to John 18. What we're doing is looking at several passages of Scripture that just make reference to the people practicing regular prayer, fasting, good deeds. In John 18, this is where uh, Judas comes and he knows where to find Jesus in the garden. One and two. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. He often would go out there. And as, as, as is <clears throat> uh, described elsewhere in, in other gospels, the other three, what are they doing in that garden? They're praying. 
Jesus would go out there and they would, they would pray together, wouldn't they? They would pray. And prayer, very much a part. And I, I, I know you know that. It's just, a, it's the kind of practice that we need to give all the more attention to. All the more attention to on a good and consistent basis. It was emphasized in Jesus' ministry. When they say, you know, the disciples of John are praying and fasting. The disciples of Pharisees are praying and fasting. Jesus says, oh, he doesn't say you don't need to do that. No. No, he says, time will come when, yes, the bride will be taken away and my disciples will be fasting too. And Jesus was praying with his disciples here. It was his practice. It was so well known that, that Judas could say, okay, I know where these guys will be found. They're going to be in the garden. That's where they go to pray. They gather, they go with the Lord and they pray together. With regard to doing good, I brought along Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. Doing good. There again, you know, I speak of how uh, we talk about prayer and, and we're familiar with the need to do good, good deeds. Well, I think we could, we could do a better job there too. If you're reading the King James Version, uh, the Matthew 6 says uh, uh, alms, doesn't it? And that uh, we tend to think of giving money. You know, you're driving up to the stop sign, you're going to go to the grocery store, pull up the stop sign, the traffic light, and there's somebody there that needs help. And so I'll give some money to the poor person, the homeless person, that's, um, that's, that's um, looking for um, some a handout, right? And you know how it is. I mean, sometimes you see somebody that looks like they might be legitimately crippled, right? Yeah. They're always on the dirty side. And I'm not sure if that's just to make it look more attractive or that as somebody you might give money, you're not real attractive. Uh, but then other times they look, you know, healthy, strong, and they just are homeless for one, one reason or another, looking for some money, right? Well, we think of almsgiving as, as it could include that, but it's not limited to that. I deliberately brought along a, a translation that, that uh, gives it as charitable deeds or good deeds. Another translation just refers to righteous acts. With me there? Referring to the Matthew 6 passage, when you do your righteous acts, when you do your charitable deeds, it's not just giving money to a poor person is what we're saying, okay? There are needy people. At any given time, some people who are not normally needy can be needy. People right here, good there? Going through struggling, fighting, difficult set of circumstances they've got before them. Our hearts should be very open to such. Amen? Amen? And not assuming, well, they're normally doing okay. I'm sure they've got some means of uh, taking care of themselves because they always do. Uh, there are some people that are chronically needy, I know. And then there are other people that are just intermittently needy. Right? We should be a people whose hearts are open to the ministry and the guidance of the Holy Spirit that we're ready to be there for somebody to help them on out. Amen. To be there for them with charitable deeds. And it's not just, you know, reaching into your, your pocket and, and, and um, giving them 50 or 100 bucks. No, it, it might be just the time. A phone call. A little bit of uh, assistance. Um, you know, whatever it is. Uh, cleaning their house, watching their kids, fixing this or that. You with me there? Charitable deeds. You know, we're taught to treat others like we would like to be treated. And you know, you might not sit and, and think of yourself as a particularly needy individual, but from time to time, needs do arise, don't they? And you appreciate somebody lending a helping hand. Charitable deeds. Righteous acts. The Bible teaches us to, as much as it lies within us, we're to do good to all men, all men especially to those that are of the household, household of faith. Amen? So we're mindful. These are the people that we know, the people that are around us. And from time to time, yeah, they need. And we are to be there for them. Jesus went about doing good. Look at me over to Matthew 6 again, to a passage of scripture that we skipped. We skipped over what? 
the model prayer, didn't we? Yeah? In prayer, we should be mindful of the coming kingdom, the advancement of the kingdom. We should be praying and looking forward to Jesus' coming again and the advancement of this kingdom until he does come. Sharing the gospel with people, seeing citizens added to that kingdom. And our heart's prayer and cry is always what? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Just 9 and 10 of Matthew 6. After this manner, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And our prayer is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen? And so we're mindful in, in prayer and, and, our, and our, our works each day. We want Father to be glorified. And his, his purposes to be furthered in us and through us. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Look with me over to Jude. Jude. Charitable deeds. When you're giving of yourself to somebody else, you are denying self, aren't you? It's not in you naturally to prefer others better than yourself. But by the grace of God, that's what we do, isn't it? We learn, we practice. You know, the Bible teaches us to do what? Exercise ourselves unto godliness. Exercise. Practice godliness is what's being said there. Don't think that, oh, we touch on this plenty of times. If God says it, we don't need to have some, uh, some special feeling that we ought to do it. He said it, that ought to be good enough. Amen? If he commands us, then we obey. But uh, prayer among other things, will build us up. This Jude, verse 20, Ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. We're touching on passages of Scripture that talk of the benefits of charitable deeds, praying, fasting. Amen? To honor God, you build yourself up. Could you stand to do some self-building up? Praying in the Holy Ghost. That doesn't take a whole lot. You know what might happen? If you, start, if you did a little bit more praying in the Holy Spirit, you might get strong enough to even fast. Could happen. Praying in the Holy Spirit. You build yourself, you get stronger. And we, each one of us has a responsibility to be working at getting stronger. To be working at getting stronger. <clears throat> Look with me over to Matthew 17. Matthew 17. Prayer, fasting, good deeds, good works. They promote spiritual strength and development. Of the individual. Look at me down to verse 19, Matthew 17. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? Well, you may be familiar with this one. Jesus had been <clears throat> up in the Mount of Transfiguration. He came on down. And the disciples had evidently been unable to cast out a demon. There was quite a crowd around, wasn't there? And they asked, <clears throat> why after Jesus had dealt with the demon, the disciples came and said, why could not we cast him on out? Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Well, here we have a passage of scripture. And there have been plenty that have taught uh, that, that there are certain demons, certain kinds of demons, that don't go out by, by anything less than by prayer and fasting. Well, <clears throat> uh, let's talk about that in the close context of what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> he, the Lord Jesus, 
in response to their question, why could not we cast them on out? He says what? Because of your unbelief. unbelief. He doesn't immediately go and, and say to them what? You haven't fasted and prayed enough. He doesn't say that, does he? No, he says, it's because of your unbelief. He goes on and he then talks about <clears throat> uh, this kind goes not out but by prayer and fasting. The takeaway should be that we're going to grow stronger in faith and in the power of the Holy Spirit, more keenly sensitive, moving in a greater authority as we fast and pray. Then we will have the faith to say to the demon, go, and he goes. The prayer and fasting, don't think in terms of there being a certain class of demons that require extra prayer and fasting. Think, of terms, think in terms of Christians needing to pray and fast, that they would be strong in faith and to be able to do any of the works, to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, raise the dead. Amen? Because they're a people who believe God, who take him at his word. You see, through prayer and fasting and being doers of the word, we grow stronger. So whether it's the sick person or the demonized person, we're better equipped. We're, you might say, we're vessels that have purged ourselves from the ignoble and are meat for the master's use, prepared for every good work. Fasting and praying. Fasting and praying. Go with me back over to Matthew 6. Look at verse 1 again. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. To be seen of, of men. Well, that's repeated in each of these three, isn't it? The, the good works, the charitable deeds, the, uh, the prayer and the fasting to be seen of men. We don't practice what we do in Christianity just so that other people will see and be impressed with our spirituality, the, our level of commitment and devotion. You know, you don't go around telling people about how much you pray. And, and this list is not an exhaustive list, okay? We don't boast in self. We don't try to get other people to look at us and be impressed with our spirituality. We're not praying... <clears throat> And thinking, well, I want to get to know the Lord better, but I want other people to know how much I want to get to know the Lord. You heard that, right? We're not trying to impress other people with, with our devotion, our zeal, our, uh, how much we gave and how long we served and how selflessly we, we toiled and, and how, how fervently... Uh, we prayed, storming the gates of hell and crying out to Jesus, hanging onto the horns of the altar and sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. And <clears throat> how long you fasted? How many hours? Minutes? All the opportunities that came your way. Somebody came along and asked you out to dinner, but no, I couldn't do that because I'm fasting again. We're not doing what we're doing to be seen of men, are we? No, we're not trying to impress other people. As you, you know, and we all appreciate Jesus pointing this on out because as soon as you start getting, you probably recognize it already, as soon as you get serious or whenever you get a little bit more serious, you have this tendency, we have this tendency to be impressed with what we've done. You with me there? I mean, if you, were to, if you were to go beyond what you would normally do in terms of prayer, maybe, you, maybe your prayer time is, um, 
You know, you spend whatever, 20 minutes a day in prayer, half an hour in prayer, an hour in prayer. You go do two or three times that. I mean, you just take all morning prayer. Stay up all night and pray. That could be a, an edifying experience. But you know what? You would probably have to deal with thinking how you wanted somebody to know. <laughs> Come on now. Isn't that the truth? When you start, you know, you do something extra. I shared the gospel with 16 people today. And they all got saved. You should hang around me more and get some, some, some of the spiritu spirituality rub off. And you know, that's not why you started out doing it. You didn't start out, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to stay up all night in prayer just so that I can, you know, tell somebody I stayed up all night in prayer. But you do it and you will find you're thinking, you know, not everybody stays up all night in prayer. I don't know anybody that's staying up all night in prayer. And, and we, we have this tendency to start thinking about ourselves a little bit. And he warns us not to do that. Because we're not, we're, not, we're not interested in the glory that comes from man, are we? No. But he warns us. Take, he said take heed, doesn't he? Take heed. Take warning that you don't do well, and even when it might start out pure and holy and, and for, for righteous reasons, take heed that you don't go looking for a little bit of glory, a little bit of recognition from men. Because those are good things to do. Praying fervent, that is praying fervently and earnestly and long and hard and, and engaging in, in righteous acts, good deeds, doing plenty of that. That's a good thing to do, isn't it? And fasting, that's a good thing to do. But we don't, uh, we, we need to take heed, be on guard against Wanting to be seen of men. The Bible says, if we do that, we have our reward. We have our reward. <clears throat> of course, there are um, uh, plenty of professing Christians where there is little to no danger of being seen of men <laughs> engaging in prayer and fasting. <laughs> But again, this is, this is to be a part of uh, <clears throat> normal Christianity. Go with me over to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. This is a passage of scripture where Jesus is, oh, you might say he's laying into the, the religious leaders. He's, um, he's identifying their hypocrisy, isn't he? In some detail and at some length. We pick it up in verse 2 of Matthew 23. The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not according to their works, for they say and do not. They bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues. Of course, you know, the, you don't go and sound the bell and sound the trumpet and make the noise and to be, be seen. But there are those that practiced their religion to be seen of men. And I think we'd all be well served to do some self-examination and make sure that that is not the motive. You got a lot of people who serve faithfully. And as I say, if you're going to, if you're going to uh, uh, consider stirring yourself up and pushing yourself beyond where you are at present, then there will be the temptation to think highly of yourself. Like you've, like you've really done something. And if you've really done something, then, you know, it would be nice if somebody else saw it, recognized it, and could um, uh, commend you for it. And your father, who sees in secret, will reward you. He says in verse 11, He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whosoever exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. 
There's a lot of self-humiliation or self-abasement in serving others, in praying, acknowledging our desperate dependence upon the Lord, in fasting. We humble or abase ourselves in fasting, don't we? We put our self down. I'm not going to cater to its cries. I'm going to say no to my flesh, deny my, my own personal interests, because I don't think that I, I deserve that. You know, a lot of what we do in terms of, of, of uh, providing ease for ourselves is because we think we deserve it. Again, in fasting, we'd find a good example, right? What do you do the day after fasting? Catch up. Because <laughs> you deserve it. And that, that can be the mindset, can't it? Because we've done something good and we deserve a little bit of self-indulgence. Well, <clears throat> here he speaks of humility, very, very closely linked to fasting. I don't deserve uh, the indulgence of my flesh. Oh, I, you know, I, I, I might like it, but I don't, I don't think that I've got it coming. Ease, comfort, pleasure. Nope. <clears throat> I think in terms of being a servant of God, pursuing his purposes. I say no, it's, a, it's an exercise in denial of self that we might pursue the interests of our master. Drop down to verse 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you, you'll receive greater condemnation. So they prayed long prayers. Perhaps very eloquently, very loudly, perhaps. But for a pretense to be seen of men, to impress people. Look how long they pray. Look how loudly pray. Look how sound. Out. Listen to the fervency in their prayer. And Jesus is uh, calling them on the hypocrisy. They're doing what they do to be seen of men. That's not to say praying long is wrong or playing, praying loudly is wrong. He's saying these people did it to be seen of men. You with me there? And so uh, we stand before the one who sees all, who knows our hearts, who searches and tries our hearts, don't we? And he knows that you're praying loud or long to be seen, to be recognized. He knows that, doesn't he? I do not Stand here and say, well, <clears throat> these long prayers, long is wrong because the hypocrites prayed long prayers. That's not what he's condemning. He's condemning that they did it to be seen of men. That's what he's condemning. Loud is not wrong just because it's heard by others. We're running out of time this morning, but you know that whole um, uh, back there in Matthew 6, you know, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Good way to think of that is that your left hand doesn't know much because it doesn't have a brain. Good there? You with me there? Right now, my left hand doesn't know that my right hand's in my pocket. Does it? it just don't take that too far, is what I'm saying. And really, I, I think we get the point. We should not uh, make too much in our own minds of what we are doing as unto the Lord in humble obedience to his will. Amen? He's, when he talks about doing what we do in secret, whether it's, whether it's uh, inconspicuously doing serving, you know, is, well, I, I, I wanted to do something nice for Mike, <clears throat> but I can't think of a good way to do it without him knowing it. So, sorry, Mike. <laughs> Couldn't figure out how to slip you that 50 without you knowing it, you know? So, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what kind of cut you going to take, Sam? The, uh, we're just not doing it outwardly, boastfully, ostentatiously, are we? No. No, but if I'm, um, oh, you know, after a service like this and, and you're talking with somebody and they've got a need and you're going to pray for them right then and there, you don't need to think in terms of, well, I'll pray for you later because I can't pray in secret because there are other people around here. Or, I can't pray, pray, I can only pray in secret. I can't pray publicly. No, nothing wrong with praying, but you're just not doing it to be seen. Amen? And you can, you can pray 
with other people around and you can be loud, pray loudly. You know, there's, I think there's some volume in effectual fervent. You with me there? Yeah, it's hard to imagine effectual fervent silent prayer. You with me there? There's nothing wrong with getting um, vocal with, with the Lord. The emphasis here is not on doing what you're doing to be seen of men. Because if that's why, if that's the motivation, you've got your reward. Verse 27. What do you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? You are like whited tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So you can have those that appear righteous outwardly, but inwardly, no, not so. <clears throat> uh, finish with me over in John 12. John 12. Look at me down to verses 42 and 43. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Make sure that this interest in the... the the <clears throat> attention or the commendation, the praise of men does not become an influence. We're not interested in what we are not men pleasers, as the scripture says elsewhere. We don't do what we do or refrain from doing what we ought to do just to please and to appease men. We ought to obey God. He's the one that we serve. Amen? So, yeah. <clears throat> Engage in charitable acts. Good deeds. Alms deeds. Pray. And fast. These are normal practices of normal Christians. Good, healthy Christians. will cause you to grow, will advance the purposes of, of our God in this earth, in us and in our midst. And when you do those things, you know that you have a Father in heaven who sees you. Don't be looking for the praises of men. Don't be doing what you do to get attention, to get promotion, to win somebody's favor. Do it before God, knowing that your father sees, and he also sees your heart. He sees that you do what you do to honor him, to please him, to be a blessing to his people, for his glory. And you'll be rewarded openly. And let that promise <clears throat> be all that we need. Amen? We'll finish there for this morning. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise. That Lord, you, you teach us <clears throat> through your word of practices that should be so much a part of our, our normal Christian walk. Practices like charitable deeds, good deeds and praying and fasting. We want to grow. We want to grow in grace and in our relationship with you. And yet, Father, we don't want to take any pride in how regularly or fervently we do these things. We involve ourselves in these practices. No, Father, we we want to do what we do for your honor and glory, in your name. We don't want to be doing what we're doing as unto men. Ultimately, for our own praise, we 
Lord, desire to honor and glorify you. Trust you for that grace, O oh Father God. The grace to do good works, to pray, to fast, and to do so for your honor and glory. We thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand together. Minister to the Lord in song as we conclude. Hallelujah. Thank you for your goodness, Father God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord. God's grace and peace go with you all.